Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Kenny Coleman. I'm uh, President and CEO of the Birmingham Business Alliance. We want to welcome you to today's program, our Market Insights on the Birmingham region with uh, Anup Mishra. We're really excited for our program today. Wanted to give you just a few uh, housekeeping uh, items. Uh, all participants have been placed on mute. Um, you can send questions, however, to our host. If you'll use the chat function to do that, just click on host and we'll send, uh, you'll, that'll get your questions to our host. Uh, the way we've got our program designed today is, is uh, we've asked Anoop to take a little time and share some Fed insights on what's happening in our marketplace. And then we'll have hopefully 20 minutes or so for some Q&A at the end. So. As we mentioned, please go ahead and um, get, your, get your questions in to the host. Uh, so with that, let me uh, go ahead and introduce Anoop. And again, we're really, really excited to have Anoop with us today. Uh, he's Vice President and Regional Executive at the Birmingham branch of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. He's responsible for the Birmingham branch's board of directors. He leads the branch's community and economic development outreach activities and also oversees its economic and financial education programs. As part of the regional economic information network, he's responsible for economic intelligence gathering at the local business level and academic communities to help support uh, Atlanta banks contributions to the monetary process. Uh, before joining the bank, uh, Anoop owned a consulting firm and was previously the chief executive officer at Workforce QA, a provider of employment screening and compliance services. He was also the chief operating officer for EDPM, which is also a provider of employer screening solutions prior to its acquisition uh, at Workforce QA. Uh, Anoop also worked for Accenture as a manager in its strategy practice for financial services. And he also worked for uh, Operation New Birmingham uh, back in the uh, mid 90s when and he and I like to say those were the heydays of economic development in and around Birmingham. He and I worked uh, together back then. Um, he also he earned his bachelor's degrees in political science and business administration from Birmingham Southern College and has a master's degree in business administration from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. With that, please join me in welcoming Anoop Mishra. Hey, thanks, Kenny. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, I, first of all, I really appreciate, very appreciative of uh, you and the BBA for inviting me to uh, uh, provide some of these market insights. And let me also be one of many to welcome you back to Birmingham. Um, after uh, many years, it was great working with you. Uh, back in the 90s when I was at uh, uh, ONB and you were at MDB, and I'm looking forward to continuing to, uh, to work together, even going forward in a bit of a, a different capacity. Um, I appreciate everybody being on. Um, if you can give me one second, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my screen up here uh, and then we'll just get started from there. So hopefully you should be able to see my slide here um, in presentation mode. So then I'm going to give me one second. All right. So so what, I, what I'd like to do uh, today is, and then I, I, I'm very cognizant of the fact that everybody's got a lot of Zoom meetings and a lot of virtual meetings going on. And, you know, and what I'm gonna try to avoid is showing just a lot of slides on data. Um, because I think we have a sense of where the data is. I'm certainly going to speak to some of the things that we're seeing in the pandemic environment in terms of economic outlook and recovery. But I, I wanted to provide some thoughts uh, in terms of outlook, recent Fed actions, as well as uh, looking specifically at the issue of equity. 
uh, in recovery and what that means, because that has certainly been not just a hot button issue in the, the media and in the economic landscape, but it's certainly been top of mind here at the Fed. Uh, after about, I'd say about 25 minutes or so, I think Kenny and I will really have more of a Q&A session and would love to get feedback and questions that you might have. I know some questions have already been submitted and try to address those uh, the best that I can. Um, so with that, I obviously always start off a presentation like this uh, noting that I am uh, not speaking for the Fed. Um, these are just my opinions. Uh, some of you probably heard Chair Powell uh, last week uh, give his press conference following the uh, FOMC uh, meeting. So these are just going to be my opinions and my thoughts in terms of where we are, where we think we're going, and the role of equity uh, that the Fed sees in terms of economic outlook. But I want to just take a step back and, and take a couple of minutes and just level set what we do here at the Fed. Um, most people are familiar to, to varying uh, degrees, and, and I know that uh, uh, Nancy Gerdeke, who is uh, on our board of directors, is on, and, and she's been a, a really terrific part. Several other folks that are on the call here, uh, we have meetings at the Atlanta Fed. Um, in understanding what the business environment is like, and it's really helpful for us, because when we coordinate monetary policy, Part of what we want to do is to not just look at economic data, and we have a lot of economists and we have a lot of data that we look at, but the data tends to be backward looking, and we really want to marry that with uh, forward looking information. So getting a chance to meet and talk to business leaders uh, throughout Birmingham and throughout the state of Alabama really has meant that the Fed can help to provide a bridge and a voice for businesses locally as well as within our state in terms of what's the best outcome for monetary policy look like. We have 12 Federal Reserve Banks. Um, the uh, Reserve Bank of Atlanta is one of the 12. Uh, we also have a board of governors. So Chair Jay, Jay Powell is one of the governors and we have uh, uh, four other governors as well. And together, the 12 Reserve Bank presidents as well as the board of governors really uh, formed the Federal Open Market Committee. And um, the, the committee is responsible for a lot of the monetary policy decisions. And just to, just to clarify, uh, we do not participate in the fiscal policy arena. So if it's involving taxes, the Department of Treasury, that is not our purview. We are really in the monetary policy space. Um, when people tend to think of monetary policy, the first and foremost uh, tool that they really think about is the interest rate. Um, and if you have lower rates or if you have higher rates, a lot of that is, has been driven by the Fed funds rate, which is sort of our interbank borrowing uh, rate that the Fed does control. It's a short-term rate. And as you probably saw last week, the Fed had a meeting, and in that FOMC meeting, they made the decision to keep the Fed funds rate effectively at zero. Uh, and it's been at zero really for uh, the last few months since the pandemic hit. That is our primary tool. And in, in, in terms of how it thinks about impacting uh, our economy going forward, the Fed also did something else last week. And, and, and I, I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes talking about this because this was actually a bit of a sea change for the Fed, uh, what happened last week uh, compared to really what's happened in the last several years. Um, not only did the Fed determine that they're going to keep rates uh, at about zero, um, but the other thing that they really reinforced uh, is the fact that it is probably going to be at zero for an extended period of time. Um, the summary of economic projection shows that we're probably going to see a zero lower bound for an interest rate through 2023, you know, if not longer. And I think they made that pretty clear that if business circumstances don't significantly change, this is going to be a long process. And part of the importance of doing that was to make sure that we don't have, or is to make sure that we're minimizing some level of uncertainty, uh, particularly with regards to where rates are going to be. But I think the more profound thing that really has happened in last week that Chair Powell talked about at the Fed is really rethinking the way that we look at inflation 
and labor markets. So the Fed has always had a dual mandate. We want to maximize employment and we want pricing stability. And we want to make sure that the financial system is stable. Pricing stability really means inflation. So the Fed has always been very sensitive about making sure that we don't have runaway inflation. Our inflation target's been 2% since 2012 for the last uh, eight years. And we've always wanted to maximize employment. So what is kind of the, the sea change that took place really in the last few weeks and that culminating in the press conference last week? The Fed essentially uh, made the statement that we're going to view how we think about maximizing employment a little bit differently. And we're also going to think about a tolerance for inflation a little bit differently. Before last week, the framework for the Fed has been we want 2% inflation, but we are always a little bit concerned about going uh, over 2%, getting to 2.4, 2.6, 2 2.8%. 2 Essentially, what the Fed did last week was they said, uh, we are actually going to be more comfortable with a longer period of either lower or higher inflation, that we're going to try to average inflation over a period of time. Uh, so we don't have to worry about you know, being at 3% inflation for uh, a few uh, months, because at some point, we think it's going to average out with lower inflation. Practically, what does that mean? Because again, there's uh, some of the monetary policy can really be kind of wonkish. So just practically speaking, here's what it really means. When the Fed looks at our employment numbers, and we've had very tight labor markets, um, typically, if you have tighter labor markets and you have really low un unemployment, there is a concern that the economy may be overheating and that we may see wage pressures and we may see inflationary pressures. So one of the things the Fed has typically done during a boom market um, has they've typically tried to raise rates. And we raise rates with the idea that we want to stave off inflationary pressures that tend to follow. With this change last week, essentially what the Fed has signaled is that you know, even if we have an expansionary period, even if labor markets are doing really well and they're pretty tight, we're okay with that. And we're not necessarily going to step in and immediately raise rates to try to control inflation. If inflation goes up a little bit, we can live with that. And this actually has some profound implications for how we think about our economy, but all the, also on the issue of equity in the economy. One of the criticisms of the Fed, and, and I think one of the, the commentary on the Fed has been that even during a times when business has been really good and the economy has been going well, um, that, that uh, business boom has not been equitable. So even when the uh, unemployment rate was 3.5% eight months ago, the black unemployment rate was actually almost double that. It was 6.1%. So low and moderate income individuals have not always fared as well. There's been a lag period. And so with this change, what the Fed has essentially opened, uh, opened us up to is saying that even if the economy recovers, we're not going to be quick to raise rates and try to uh, slow things down because that will actually give opportunities for other low and middle income individuals, for other areas, uh, whether it's Blacks or Hispanics, um, other demographics that typically there's been a lag in terms of them being successful in a great economy, uh, it will give them an opportunity to flourish uh, a lot more than, uh, than in prior years. Just as an example, in 2018, when the labor markets were really strong, uh, the Fed raised rates three times. And it was in fear that there might be some inflationary pressures. Well, that never really has materialized. So, in fact, uh, Governor Brainerd with the Fed actually mentioned that if we had had this framework in place back two years ago, there was probably a strong likelihood that even as labor markets were very strong and the economy was booming in 2018, there probably would not have been any, any rate hikes. So it's, it's a pretty big uh, implication the way that we think about it. So I wanted to make some commentary on that. I think that's really important. And if you all have questions uh, in our Q&A period on, on kind of the new Fed position, I would certainly be glad to, uh, to entertain them. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what we're seeing in the current picture right now. Um, 
So uh, first of all, I would start with saying that if we think about the COVID environment really starting in March and the precipitous drop that we had in March and April as our economies were shut down, we have actually seen the pace of growth. Um, it, it, it really rose pretty quickly back in May and then in June, but we have seen the pace of growth slow a little bit. Um, where we are right now is we expect, so GDP was at about a minus 31%. Uh, annualized for the second quarter of 2020, which should not have been a surprise because we were effectively shut down as an economy. For Q3, we do expect there to be a rebound. Right now, we're forecasting about a 32% uh, growth annualized for Q3, but we do expect that that slowdown will, uh, or the recovery pace, will be a little bit slower. Our unemployment rate is 8.4% 4, 8 right now. Um, it's sled, steadily uh, come back down uh, from the high in the teens uh, right after the pandemic hit. Um, one of the things that we've seen at the Fed is that overall the trajectory of recovery will be longer. So we are projecting that we probably as an overall economy will not get back to our GDP run rate until the second half of 2022. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't certain sectors that are thriving today and that there may be other sectors that recover more quickly. But overall, if you looked at the trajectory of recovery back in April or May, I think the expectation was it was going to be more of a V-shaped recovery. It was going to be a bit more immediate and that we'd be back to where we need to be in, by, by end of the year. And um, one of the things that's really happened is we realized that the pandemic is in control and that the process of reopening the economy as well as bringing back demand is going to be a longer haul than we had initially uh, expected. The other comment that I would, I would make in terms of thinking about the pace of recovery is that we think that the pace of recovery in employment is going to be slower than the pace of recovery in market demand. So whereas GDP may be coming back uh, to our pre-COVID run rate, if you kind of think about where we were in fourth quarter 2019, whereas that may be coming back by second half of 2022, um, full employment may not come back for another year or two afterwards. One of the dynamics that we have seen uh, in this COVID environment is a number of employers uh, they made you know, some cuts, uh, not just temporary furloughs, uh, permanent layoffs, but as they made these cuts, one of the things that they did when they were trying to manage expenses was really make sure that they were trimming the fat uh, within their own um, workforce. So as we've done surveys at the Fed and as we've kind of looked even to for sort of the businesses that we've talked to, one of the things that's been clear is there's probably going to be a permanent displacement of anywhere from 10 to 20 percent of the workforce that's not going to come back even if demand returns. That's a function of automation, more technology, and again, maybe a given consideration to uh, a greater efficiency and productivity, which during boom markets tends to be less of a priority. So we don't think that employment is going to return nearly as quickly as demand will back to pre-COVID levels. Uh, right now, our projection is that we will probably get to long-term unemployment of about 4.1%. So we don't anticipate it returning back to like the 3.5, which was incredibly low by any standard. But we expect it to return to 4.1%, but we're probably looking into 2023, 2024. Um, the next thing I wanted to mention in terms of what we're seeing is there is a widening gap uh, between resilient and struggling businesses. Um, one of the things that we have heard in the economy is that COVID uh, and the circumstances surrounding the pandemic have tended to accentuate what's positive in the economy and, and really uh, accelerate or, or sort of decelerate um, very negative conditions uh, in the economy. So if you were a business that was struggling prior to COVID, 
uh, you are probably continuing to struggle um, and insolvency is a much greater issue than if you were successful before the, the pandemic. So it is really tended to exacerbate both problems and successes. So what this means is that, that uh, businesses that had carved out a really strong business model and that happened to be in a good space are continuing to flourish even as businesses that may have had some struggles um, are, are continuing to, to struggle. Another example of this is if you think about retail sales, um, generally speaking, retail sales have gone down, but you know, the consumer is, uh, consumers come down, but relative to, I think, expectations so far, uh, they've been uh, propped up. But within retail sales, there is a huge difference between if you're in home improvements and groceries versus if you're in you know, clothing or another area. There is also a, a clear differenti differentiating factor in terms of uh, a gap being widened between you know, folks, small businesses and companies that have e-commerce infrastructure and platforms that they can take advantage of and that they had developed versus those that perhaps had not gone to online retailing to help substitute uh, from the impacts of less foot traffic. So e-commerce has been a defining picture that has sometimes separated the haves and the uh, have-nots. There's also been a, a widening gap uh, uh, among individuals and demographics. So this sector or this recession has disproportionately impacted uh, minorities, Blacks and Hispanics, as well as women uh, in the workforce. So just as uh, an example, uh, in the low-skill, low-wage sector, uh, women are more represented uh, in the sector as are Hispanics and, and African Americans, but the low-wage sector has been the hardest hit by far in this economy. So there is a, a widening gap, which is a real concern, uh, even in terms of demographics uh, that, that we're seeing uh, here. And finally, I would mention that, that part of the widening gap also comes from this dynamic with the low wage versus high wage sector. Um, in the financial crisis, high wage workers and middle wage workers were severely impacted pretty quickly. Um, the low wage uh, uh, segment was not as impacted. In this recession, it's exactly the opposite. Um, high wage workers have not been as impacted. So what's happened with consumer spend is it's really shifted. So if you are a high wage or if you are a high wage earner, and let's say that you know you have a travel budget that you're going to take a family vacation and, and spend ten thousand, well you can't travel but you're still spending that 10, that 10,000 elsewhere. So you're doing home improvements or you're you know, investing the money elsewhere versus if you were low wage, uh, you're really relying on federal supports to get you through and you have been disproportionately impacted. So that widening gap is certainly a factor that we've seen. And then finally, and what's been very clear is that the public health outcomes are really going to control economic outcomes. Uh, I mean, the biggest difference between this recession and the financial crisis and most recessions we've had is that this was not a business cycle issue where there were economic fundamentals that caused problems for which we are having to work through the cycle. Um, economic conditions were actually really strong. Our inflation rate was at about 2%. Unemployment was the lowest in 55 years. GDP growth was solid in February and the pandemic hit. So this is really a public health issue that's had economic impacts. As such, uh, one of the things that I certainly hear from our you know, business relationships and that we hear across the board is the level of uncertainty is probably greater in terms of forecasting budgeting than it's ever been. And one driving force for that is that this is not a traditional business cycle where you know, uh, you know, business executives may say, well, look, this is what we're gonna do with our CapEx and this is, uh, we're gonna be in this period for the next year and then two years down the line, we're gonna plan for this. What's been really difficult is that because this is div driven by the, the pandemic, um, there is just not any clarity in terms of treatment, in terms of vaccine, in terms of, you know, are we gonna to have to shut down the economy? When can people come back to work? So all of these uncertainties 
are going to continue and ultimately until we get to more clarity on what we do with the public uh, pandemic or with a pandemic, we're not going to make as much progress in terms of economic uh, recovery. So with that, I wanted to pivot to thinking about how the Fed is thinking about recovery. Uh, so what are the, the, there are probably three things that we're really looking at uh, going forward into fourth quarter as well as into 2021. The first is the issue of layoffs. What's temporary versus what's permanent? Um, one of the biggest dynamics that we saw in the financial crisis is when layoffs happened, they were pretty quick and they were permanent. So when companies made the decision to lay people off, they weren't furloughs, they were direct permanent layoffs. Here, a lot of the layoffs have been uh, temporary. They've been furloughs. And the real question is, what percentage of these temporary layoffs end up becoming permanent? And that's still an open that's still an opening quest, that's still an open question that we're seeing here in you know, these particular uh, markets. Um, the next thing that I would probably mention regarding this is, as I alluded to earlier, was that in the financial crisis, we saw the middle wage occupations um, really impacted relatively quickly. Uh, there was some lag in construction and other fields, but by middle wage occupations, we're really talking about construction and manufacturing, um, uh, you know, travel, et, et, et cetera. Uh, some of those positions, even in, in, in banking. Uh, so middle wage occupations represent about a 41% share of employment. And, and I certainly don't want to imply that it's not been impacted because it has, but relative to the lower wage occupations and relative to what we saw in the financial crisis, middle wage occupations so far have been somewhat resilient. So the key thing that we're looking at is, will that resiliency continue? Um, one of the things that tends to drive that is, uh, if you think about construction or manufacturing, these are really based on pipeline work. So there is typically a lag between the time that you get the business and when that production actually takes place. So um, we have certainly heard early in the pandemic that a lot, a lot of the pipelines have started to dry up. And so if you're, uh, if you're in construction, you know, you've been working off of your backlog and that's kind of kept the employment numbers up. So the real question is, uh, will some of those capital expenditure projects, will some of those capital projects come back to the degree to where that market can remain employed or has the pipeline shrunk to the point to where we may be expecting uh, another round of layoffs? And that middle wage market is something, like I said, has relatively been unaffected compared to the financial crisis, but it represents a huge share of um, uh, consumers and represents a huge share of our employment. The other thing that we're looking at is the impact of structural changes. So if we kind of think about, uh, you know, things like business travel, uh, how much, you know, commercial real estate, um, all of you have, have heard and, and have, you know, seen information that really points to the fact that, that there's some, a lot of uncertainty right now in, in some of these markets. Um, clearly, one of the things that has happened as a result of the pandemic is companies have rethought business models. In fact, I was I was actually just on a call earlier this morning, you know, with a company and, and they made the decision in the pandemic to exit, you know, a major market that had been a core market of theirs for many years because they just didn't see much recovery. And they're uh, they're going to pivot to a couple of other emerging markets. And we've seen companies do this, uh, not only with their business models, but also think about what their G&A expenses might look like. Um, several surveys that we've done at the Fed indicate that across the board, we're probably looking, you know, most companies are, are thinking that even when uh, the economy comes back a little bit more and travel can resume, that they're anticipating that travel budgets will be cut permanently by about 30% or, or so uh, for, for business travel. So what does that mean for industries that are reliant on business travel or for, for group travel? So, um, and if you think about the commercial real estate market, uh, what does the impact of social distancing and even the issue of you know, elevators and office buildings, uh, are these things that structurally are gonna be very different uh, a year from now, two years from now, 
um, square footage for employee, uh, remote work. Um, I, I will tell you in the remote work CRE space, the, the survey information that we've seen so far, and, and again, this is very early and, and sometimes it's a little bit, a uh, little bit difficult to, to really know how people are going to think post pandemic. But what we've seen across the economy is, or across sectors, is typically right now about 5% of the workforce um, works remotely. And the numbers that we've seen of that increasing are going to be more in the neighborhood of 10 to 15% being sort of full-time remote workers. So that obviously has some consequences. We don't think it's going to be what we have right now. Uh, you know, our current remote posture is probably uh, uh, not a, it's, it's an outlier, but, but we do think that in the long term, that remote work piece will be very different and that will have some profound implications for thinking about our various economic sectors. And finally, one of the things that we're looking at is the health of consumers um, without the same level of federal supports. What does that, what does that look like? Um, now, we don't know what's going to happen uh, with fiscal policy, uh, given the elections are coming up in a few weeks. Uh, you know, there hasn't been any real uh, additional fiscal supports passed. Uh, you know, I will tell you from the Fed's perspective, we typically don't comment at all on fiscal policy. It's part of our efforts to remain apolitical. Um, we don't want to be encouraging of a particular policy position, but almost to a person, I mean, from Chair Powell to Raphael Bostic, our CEO to multiple Fed presidents, I think we've, the Fed's been very vocal about the fact that additional federal supports really are going to be needed. Now, it may not be to the level of an additional 600 a week for federal unemployment benefits. It may be uh, a lesser amount. It may or may not be another round of PPP. But there is certainly concern that if we don't have any additional federal supports, um, that there are that the consumer confidence is going to wane even further, and it may be a barrier to continued uh, recovery into fourth quarter and into 2021. So that's something that we're obviously looking at. Um, like, like I mentioned, I'm going to be uh, taking questions here at the end, uh, but but I wanted to, to pivot. So that's our current picture of what the Fed is thinking. Here are some of the factors that we're thinking about in terms of recovery. And I want to just take the next five minutes and talk a little bit about the issue of equity um, in terms of how the Fed is thinking about economic equity today. You know, several years ago, we probably would not have been having this conversation, even though the Fed has always looked at the issue of uh, structural um, uh, differences in the economy between lower income and higher income individuals, uh, you know, by race, by ethnicity, uh, by gender, as well as rural versus urban. Uh, more than ever today, the issue of maximum employment and the fact that there are real disparities uh, economically uh, among uh, a variety of different factors is something that we're taking into account when we think about economic prosperity. So I wanted to just take uh, a few minutes and just highlight some of the work that we're doing at the Fed and the way that we're thinking about this at the Fed. And this is by no means a full picture, but this will kind of give you a sense of how we're thinking about this at the Atlanta Fed. Um, and this has been something that we really started this process about a, a, a year and a half, a couple of years ago. And that is thinking about the issue of economic mobility and resilience, uh, which really impacts those that have not been in a very good position historically, um, specifically by ethnicity and, and race and, and gender. If you look at the map, um, very simply, this is a map, uh, and Raj Chetty and, and some, uh, some other uh, folks have done a lot of work in this idea of intergenerational mobility. So one of the questions that was very simply has been asked is, if you are an individual, how much more likely are you to be better off than your parents were a, a generation ago? And without getting into the data, what this map shows is that if you're in a red area, your intergenerational economic mobility is really bad. If you're in a bluer area, then that means that you are more likely in the next generation to be better off than your parents were. So from the Atlanta Fed perspective, our six state region, the red area covers it like a glove. And that's incredibly disconcerting uh, you know, for us. So when we think about the ability of individuals to become upwardly mobile economically, 
that is a large part of how we think about economic equity. You know, are we enacting policies that help to reverse some of the disparities that have taken place uh, over time from, from prior policies? So this idea of how do we address um, intergenerational mobility really sort of gets the heart of equity from the Atlanta Fed perspective. Towards that end, one of the work, let's see, are you able to see my slides advance here? You may want to hit screen share one more time. Okay, sure. Hold on one second. Perfect, we can see him now. Okay, if I, can you see this uh, benefit slide? No. Okay, hold on one second. Now we'll just start that again. Okay, are you able to see the benefits cliff slide? Yes. Okay, great. And let me, okay, great. Okay, um, so if this is okay, uh, so let me just kind of uh, move forward. And so one of the things we're thinking about the Atlanta Fed is the idea of benefit cliffs. And very simply, it's the idea that as workers earn more income, financial resources are gonna fluctuate. So we have individuals that are on certain benefits right now, whether it's childcare subsidies, housing subsidies, uh, food assistance, uh, et cetera. And so what you wanna do is you wanna have a system to where if they're able to get more income, that they can enjoy that income. But part of what's happening is that as individuals are upwardly mobile and they gain more income, they lose certain benefits, which makes them economically not as well off. And I'll just walk through a very quickly an example of, and we'll, we'll call this person Leah. She's a 25 year old single mother. She has two kids living in Birmingham, uh, four and six years old. Um, she has been working in concessions and is looking to transition into the healthcare industry, working as a certified nursing assistant. Um, and she receives a number of different public benefits here in the Birmingham area to support herself, whether it's Medicaid, um, Affordable Care Act subsidies, earned income tax credit, food assistance, et cetera. So she is transitioning from uh, be going into concessions to being a CNA. So the real question is, should she then become a licensed uh, a practical nurse or an uh, LPN? Well, if you think about the career pathway, she absolutely should, because as a CNA here in Birmingham, the median wage is about 24,000 uh, or so. For an LPN, it's about 41,000. So if you can take that opportunity to do it, you should definitely do it. Um, hopefully you can, the, the slides are still advancing. You should be able to see what her employment income would look like if everything worked uh, according to, to normal. So if you think about the, one second here. If you think about her income level as an LPN, which is the green bar, really what should happen is she's going to go down in income for a little while as she goes through training, but it's immediately going to pick back up and it's going to be much greater than if she was a certified nursing assistant. That's the kind of mobility that we want. It should be a pretty cut and dried picture. The problem is that it's actually not. And there are a number of different factors, but one of the key issues with benefit cliffs is that what happens is, as you start going up the income scale, you may lose a certain benefit. And if you think about net resources for that household, the net resources is a function not only of your income increasing, but also the benefits that may be decreasing. So what happens to Leia is that from the age of 25, to the age of 31 or 32, or really actually the age of 32, in seven years, if she takes the LPN path, she barely breaks even. So the marginal benefit to her for the first seven years is effectively zero based on the benefits that she's 
in right now. So the way that we're kind of thinking about this is both from a policy and a practice standpoint. From a policy standpoint is really thinking about what we need to be able to do within our states as well as uh, nationally in terms of uh, altering policies to where we don't necessarily have the cliffs, where we can smooth the cliffs and we can make sure that economic mobility, there are incentives for people being able to move up that income ladder without having to, to worry about uh, not gaining. From a practice standpoint, what we want to do is to be able to let career counselors and folks who work with individuals that are making this, these decisions to know exactly where these cliffs are to where they can actually receive career counseling on the circumstances they're in and what might be best. Um, the, the Atlanta Fed has been really working closely with uh, the governor's office for the state of Alabama, they've been terrific and their human capital task force at addressing some of these issues. And from the Fed standpoint, it really starts with us in terms of thinking about uh, data and research. And we've really been working again with the governor's office to first just collect data in terms of where these cliffs are across the various counties within our state, within Jefferson County, and across various career pathways, whether it's IT or healthcare, and then putting us in a position where from a policy standpoint, we can look at making some changes, as well as from a practice standpoint, we can look at being able to counsel individuals who may be considering career uh, paths to, to let them know that here's an expectation for you in terms of mobility, and this is what might work best given your particular circumstances. So the initiative or is, is what we're calling, uh, David, which is the dashboard for Alabamians to visualize income determinations. It's very, very new. It's something that we're uh, just getting uh, ready to, to work with uh, the state and some other entities in um, thinking about how we can best utilize this to influence policy and practice. So, again, this is just one snapshot into how the Fed is thinking about equity. Uh, we're certainly looking at it in a number of different ways, uh, you know, beyond, beyond just the benefit clips piece, but hopefully that gives you a little bit more insight in terms of how we're thinking about it. So with that, I, I've tried to cover a, a number of different areas. I'm going to stop and um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, Kenny, I was going to also turn it back over to you and see if, uh, if there were some questions that we wanted to, to go through or that folks might have. Yeah, thanks Anoop for that. A, um, a, a very interesting and compelling presentation. Um, really helped to uh, outline some of the uh, systematic challenges that, that many of our residents um, <clears throat> seem to have to be able to make it through this benefits cliff. We got a question from somebody who um, works in the infrastructure space where they've got long-term capital uh, paybacks on projects and all. And so the question is going forward, what impact do you see the pandemic having on the traditional 2% inflation target? And is the target still relevant? So great question. Um, let me actually answer the second question uh, first. And that is, is the 2% inflation target even relevant? And, um, and, and I think one of the things that we saw in the change to our monetary policy framework at the Fed um, as of you know, end of August was the fact that the 2% inflation target that we had is not as relevant. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't still be anchored by the 2%, but the way that we think about what 2% means has fundamentally changed. So what the Fed has really done is we've gone from a, hey, we want to hit 2%, kind of on the nose and we don't want to be too much over to more of a flexible uh, averaging of 2%. So the Fed's perspective really has changed to, look, even if we run at 3% or 2.5%, let's say for a couple of years, that's okay. That'll be more tolerable because at some point we also know that we're going to run a little bit less. We may run at one five for a year or two. So the, the Fed's appetite for what we mean by 2% has changed from a point in time to more of a longer range averaging. Um, you know, I think the, the first question in terms of the pandemic and what it means for inflation is uh, it, there's actually been a pretty – overall inflation has been very soft. And it, you know, it's still right now at about one six or so, again, depending on which measure you look at. We do what, what's called the Business Inflation Expectation Survey 
for you know, several hundred CFOs throughout the country to get an idea of where they think inflation is going to be going in the next year. And even as of like last month's survey, looking forward in the next year, inflation is still soft. Now, this doesn't mean that certain components in our economy are, are, are bigger than ever. So if you're in sort of groceries or, you know, if you're trying to buy chicken, you know, at, at Costco, you've seen inflation in action. I mean, there is certainly some, some price changes, but overall in the economy, it's still relatively soft. And I think what the pandemic has kind of indicated is as demand has softened a bit, there's just less pricing power in the market. So it's not particularly surprising that we're not seeing more of it. We know uh, last Friday, the Fed issued new guidance to banks to try to improve access uh, to new business loans through that $600 million Main Street lending program. What's, what's the latest on it and what does it mean for small to mid-sized businesses and nonprofits in our area? Sure. So the, the Main Street lending program was uh, announced uh, very early on in the pandemic. I mean, the Fed took a number of different actions on uh, you know, shoring up various credit facilities from commercial paper uh, to, you know, municipal bonds. Um, and, and one of the areas that the Fed typically doesn't delve into is this idea of how can we lend uh, at the Main Street. The, the original proposal uh, back in April, it was really designed to be pure middle market companies that um, were probably, that were too small to have direct capital access. So they weren't able to access the capital markets, but they were bigger than uh, the sort of smaller businesses that the PPP was really targeted for. What's happened over time is that the Fed has uh, expanded the scope of uh, who is eligible. So just even a month, about, maybe about six weeks ago, we uh, nonprofits are eligible, institutions of higher education, are eligible. So they've continued to expand the scope. They've uh, dropped the you know, minimum thresholds for employees and revenues uh, over time. Now, one thing that is held true is that they still have, it, it's, it's not forgivable. So this is not like the PPP. It still has to be paid back over a five-year period. Um, you know, there's still a rate of typically, I think it's about LIBOR plus uh, three right now. And we have certain eligible lenders. We have not yet seen very much take up on the Main Street program. So last week, the update that, uh, that, that was made by the Fed was really just on some regulatory guidance in terms of uh, you know, trying to get folks more comfortable, lenders in particular, a little bit more comfortable with what the, the Fed would do. We haven't seen as much uptake yet uh, with the, the Main Street lending program. And, and that's probably due to a couple of reasons. Uh, one, Again, while there are some, some changes, we've still seen the financial markets, you know, financial institutions pretty resilient in this economy, very different from the financial crisis. So there are still deposits out there. Uh, there are, you know, there's still an appetite for banks being able to make loans, uh, 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 you know, given circumstances without necessarily needing facilitation, you know, from from the Fed. Uh, one of the purposes of the Main Street Lending Program is if those markets dry up, if that appetite is reduced and the financial institutions need more of a partner, need more of a backstop in, in trying to make some of these uh, loans, the, the Main Street Lending Facility Program is, is there. But for right now, we've not seen very much pickup. It's still available. And we do have some restrictions in terms of the lenders that are available and on the repayment uh, schedule. Very, very different from the PPP. Nuke, one of the exciting things for me in, in coming back to Birmingham is watching this rise in our entrepreneurial and startup ecosystem. The number of companies, the number of support entities have, have seen to all grow since I've spent meaningful time back uh, in, in Birmingham. I know last month, um, your Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic joined the Georgia Lieutenant Governor Duncan in announcing this partnership for inclusive innovation. And, Looked like it was a public-private partnership dedicated to growing entrepreneurial uh, ventures. How does the Fed define inclusive innovation, and do you see opportunities in Birmingham uh, and or the state of Alabama in this space? Yeah, that's a, that's a um, uh, really good point, Kenny. So, so Raphael uh, Bostic did work with Lieutenant Governor uh, Duncan, and they had a task force, and this was this was statewide, and and the idea really was to. 
um, how can we ensure that ecosystems for innovation flourish? And, and I think one of the real defining distinctions they made was it's not just we want startups, but we want to really have an ecosystem. And, you know, when we think of an ecosystem, it includes a number of different components. It's not just sort of the business itself, it's the lending institutions, and it's a lot of different factors that ensure that small businesses and startups can thrive. I think that Birmingham and the state, we're in a, a terrific, uh, terrific position. But I, I do want to clarify one thing. When we think about, uh, when we think about inclusiveness and inclusivity, it's not just demographics and it's not just, you know, a black and white and, and Hispanic or male female. It's also other factors. It's urban and rural. So, you know, if you think about, particularly in Alabama, I think one of the things that uh, is, is very clear is that we have rural markets um, that economically have not been flourishing you know, to the degree that maybe some of the urban markets are. And even within urban markets, there are a lot of changes based on other factors. So I think the idea of inclusivity, first and foremost, has to encompass uh, a number of other factors, even beyond just the traditional demographics that we think of. Why I say I think that Birmingham is in a great position is a, a lot of the work that we've already been doing and that we've started, um, and that and I know the, the BBA has been very active in this, in workforce development, has really you know, thought about connecting the supply of workers to potential demand. And you know, if you think about the supply of labor and the supply of workers, that's going to be really important. One of the things that we have uh, at, uh, as an advantage here in the state um, in, in the city, but even in the sixth district in the southeast, is you know from a, a diversity and equity standpoint, think about the number of HBCUs you know that we have here. Uh, we have you know our Atlanta Fed sixth district has more than half of all the HBCUs in the country, and you know as remote work becomes more prevalent, I think we have a real opportunity. And, and if you think about in Birmingham, the access that we have to HBCUs and to um, a, a really terrific labor force, if we can help make some of those connections, we are a, a step ahead uh, in that respect. And I think there are gonna be a lot more opportunities, even post pandemic, for us to take advantage of being able to connect some of the, the startup opportunities to the, the labor advantages that we have, particularly in terms of inclusive labor advantages. Well, thanks for sharing that. We, we placed in the chat a, um, uh, a link to the Alabama governor's uh, Alabama Innovation Commission. And so, Anoop, you may, you may be hearing more from us here soon. Sure. Um, you also mentioned about potential policy initiatives to help smooth out some of the benefit clips. We saw David was going to be a great information portal to be able to get into hands of people who might advise, uh, advise folks who are having challenges here uh, evaluating what they should do. What are some potential policy levers you think the Fed could pull to help smooth out the benefit clips? So, you know, this is, I think this is one of those areas when we kind of think about what the Fed does well. Um, you know, part of what we have to also think about is what the Fed doesn't necessarily do as well and kind of what's not our, our core. Um, what I think we do very well and where we can and, and have been a really good partner is in the area of research and data. And, 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 and I think you kind of saw from the dashboard, our focal point really has been one, you know, I think uh, having a soapbox in which to really advocate for this issue, and that's something that we've been doing for a while. And and we've we found again, we found just terrific support, bipartisan support. Um, I, I think from a policy standpoint. So, but the second thing that we've really tried to do beyond just sort of the soapbox and advocating for a particular issue is, um, you know, getting the research behind it. And so we've really been working with, uh, you know, the governor's office here, but also with other entities. Uh, throughout our district in terms of uh, being able to provide some of the research support to where decisions can be made using the most updated, most current information. One of the interesting things about the benefit clips piece is that this has been something on the radar for federal policymakers for years and years. I mean, this is not, this is not a new thing, but, but typically the data at a micro level, at a county or a local level, 
has not been very available. And so that's been sort of the next step that we've taken. Um, from a policy initiative standpoint, that is something that I think from the Fed's perspective, we would really leave to you know, the policy makers, uh, whether it's some type of smoothing of the cliffs. So you know, some, some of the things that we've heard is, is it possible as opposed to where there's a cliff where if you hit a certain income level, you, you know, and, and then you sort of completely lose a benefit, can, once you hit the income level, can that benefit be reduced more proportionately to as your income increases? So there is some benefit there. You know, there have also been some discussions around potentially increasing the amount of assets that can be held before some of these, you know, cliffs uh, uh, kick in. But, but I think our perspective is if we can get the research done and be able to put policymakers in a point where they can make the best decisions possible, that's going to be ideal. Thanks. We'll probably make this last question to Noob. There was an um, opinion piece last week in Barron speculating the Fed might announce a digital currency in 2021. Um, how's the Fed thinking and evaluating potential digital currency? Well, I, um, I, don't, I don't think that they uh, consulted with us directly <laughs> before they made that, uh, that, that declaration. Um, so, so the digital currency piece is certainly something that's been on our radar for you know a, a few years. And this is you know if you kind of think about the Bitcoin and Libra. Um, so, so the Fed has had we, we have digital currency from the standpoint of we have reserves that are all digital. So you know transactions that you make that don't involve cash is digital uh, transactions. What digital currency? And I think the piece that you refer to, what digital currency from the Fed standpoint really means is is the Fed, meaning is a central bank, really going to have some issuance of, of currency sort of directly to businesses or directly to entities? And, and there's just not any immediate plan you know, for that happening uh, you know, in the near term. Uh, and again, um, obviously, you know, circumstances can, can, can change, but you know, I think, and Chair Powell has uh, you know, alluded to this uh, sometime to last year, a couple of the key differences with digital currency that maybe some other countries, central banks have tried is, you know, first, we just have a much more complex banking system than, than most other countries. I mean, we have tens of thousands of financial institutions or thousands of financial institutions, as opposed to, you know, some countries that where they may have, you know, a handful. Um, and second, cash is actually very big in, here in the US. And so we have an incredibly strong competitive currency. I, I know we tend to be of the mindset that, well, who uses cash anymore? But our balance sheet with cash has actually grown over the years. So even though we've seen a growth in and proliferation in online payments, cash is very much uh, a core product that we have. So there are just a lot of other security issues given the, um, the complexity of our financial system for us to kind of go into this uh, because you know, whereas a Libra or a Bitcoin, they may be able to take a lot more risks. Um, we at the Fed, we don't really have the luxury of being able to take a lot of the financial and operational risks that digital currency at this point still entail. So it's not something that we're seeing for the, uh, for the near term. Well, Anoop, let me, uh, let me, on behalf of the Birmingham Business Alliance and our 650 investors and, and all the folks who are on the phone, let me thank you for uh, an interesting, compelling, and uh, thought-provoking uh, session today. Um, we hope you'll come back. We would love to invite you back as, as things continue to uh, evolve, I guess, post-pandemic and all. And uh, so we, we hope you'll come back and join us. That'd be great. Thank you very much, Kenny. I really appreciate it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for joining our Market Insights program. I uh, wanted to give you uh, just a quick heads up on an upcoming event um, coming soon in, in uh, later this month, uh, how to become a seller on the Amazon Business Online Store. Uh, that'll, that'll really help many of our, our small and mid-sized businesses as they uh, continue to evolve their business model in and around retail. And we wanted to also direct your attention to Onboard Birmingham. It's our latest uh, workforce development platform that will, uh, in partnership with many of our partners and HR professionals in and around Birmingham, we've launched uh, just this week to be a resource for 
potential employees as they evaluate Birmingham and its cost effectiveness compared to other metros and to help our HR professionals as they have opportunity job opportunities that uh, they want to share and, and ensure that gets a, a broad audience to view. So we invite you to uh, view the Onboard Birmingham portal at your convenience. With that, I think we've come to the top of the hour. Uh, again, we thank you for joining us. We hope you all have a safe and wonderful afternoon. We're adjourned.